All right. <clears throat> well, thank you for coming. Um, I'm Jason McGee. This is Chris Rosen. And uh, we're going to take you guys through a discussion about uh, production-ready containers uh, with IBM and Docker. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing in our cloud platform around supporting uh, native container service, uh, do some cool demos. Uh, hopefully, no one will get hurt when we do the demo later. And, and then take you through some of the stuff that we're uh, kind of working on around microservices and uh, enabling microservice applications. I'm going to kick it off, uh, do a little bit of level set on what we're seeing uh, in the market, and then Chris is going to take us through uh, some of the capabilities that we have today. So let's get started. Uh, first, what are we hearing? You know, um, uh, I've been coming to DockerCon since um, 2014. We, I've met with many of you before. Um, you know, there's an amazing amount of activity around containers, of course. I think there's a real transition that's happened over the last year or so, uh, where people have gone from uh, using containers in a primarily development context into uh, production deployments of container-based applications. Um, we heard a lot about that in the keynote this morning and, and looked at some of the evolution of the Docker project itself to support uh, some of those production scenarios a little bit better. Um, but as you move into that production setting, new concerns come to the table. Um, and we're hearing a number of kind of important requirements uh, around production containers. First, of course, is people like containers because they provide agility and they provide portability of workloads across different environments, whether that's from your laptop into the cloud or from one cloud provider to another or on premise. Um, that portability characteristic and that agility characteristic are really important for people. And so what they're looking for as they move to production is to find a way to get into production without losing those benefits. Right? We don't want to take this incredibly agile, uh, super easy to use technology that we're all using to package our applications and in the process of working our way to production, give up on all the agility um, and portability benefits that we gain from leveraging it in the first place. The second thing we're hearing is that uh, customers need deep visibility into those applications. Once you're running in production, uh, once you're uh, depending on that application for the livelihood of your application or your service, uh, you have to know what's going on, and you have to be able to see uh, into the behavior of those applications. And so one of the challenges that people confront as they move to production is, well, how do I get that visibility? How do I get insight into my uh, container application? And how do I do that without uh, polluting the, app the container itself, without having to inject uh, a bunch of uh, monitoring and operational tooling code into my container, or, ha or um, add a lot of complexity to my deployment process. So there's this tension on how do I get visibility without adding complexity into the uh, delivery process. Um, the third thing we're hearing, of course, is the, the need for security and compliance, right? Whether that's uh, network security for the applications, uh, whether that's compliance uh, from an audit and regulation standpoint, uh, whether that's uh, safety of the images and getting understanding about what's inside those images, uh, whether they're vulnerable to software package vulnerabilities, or whether they're just, frankly, not configured very well and they have weak passwords or uh, poor password expiration policies. Um, people want tools as they head to production to help them manage the security and compliance of the applications that they're running in containers. Um, and then finally, resource management. They, you know, there's a need as you get into production to manage the resources of your application, to manage uh, high priority applications differently than low priority ones, to be able to segment resources so you can have some applications be isolated, some be shared, and generally have more control over the amount of resource that's assigned to the application. And of course, to allow that application to scale automatically, uh, to be able to consume more resources as needed based on demand. Um, you know, one concrete example of this, we, we did some work uh, with Electronic Arts, specifically the Fire Monkeys uh, part of Electronic Arts, um, a big uh, mobile game house. Um, you know, they uh, have historically built um, a, a lot of their componentry directly on bare metal servers. Uh, performance, obviously, in gaming, latency and performance are incredibly important. But like all of us, uh, the ability to update quickly is really key. Um, and if you look at a mobile game, you know, the part that updates a lot in a game is the game server itself, the game logic. You, know, you have back-end data around the game um, and back-end systems, but the part that's constantly being updated, because you know, to make money in gaming today, you have to basically constantly be making new content available, new capabilities, new levels, new features available in that game. So you're constantly updating uh, the game logic. Uh, and so one of the things they did is they looked at using containers as a way to package uh, that game server code in a more easy to deploy, easy to manage form. So they wanted the agility 
uh, of containers. They wanted the ability that containers gave them to deliver more quickly. But they can't give up on any of the operational characteristics. They had to have high performance. They had to have low latency. They had to have dynamic scalability. Those are just base requirements of being a successful uh, game. And so for them, from the very beginning, as they looked at containers, those notions of visibility, scalability, speed of delivery, security, those are all critical capabilities that had to be solved to get into production. All right? So the message out of all of those things, out of those requirements, is this idea that containers by themselves are not enough. You need orchestration around the containers. You need security around the containers. You need a life cycle of tools to help you get that application running in a container from inception into a successful production setting. And so we think about this life cycle. As we've been building out our container capabilities in IBM Cloud, um, we've been thinking about, well, what is the life cycle that has to be wrapped around those containers? How do you acquire content to build your application? How do you build that container and deliver it into the cloud environment? Um, how do you run it with high availability, with scale, with, um, with operational visibility? How do you maintain it? How do you debug it, update it? All of those life cycle elements have to be addressed in order to have a successful production deployment. And so we've been trying really hard to build capability around containers uh, that solve those life cycle features. So what I'm going to do is have Chris spend a few minutes, take you through what we have, and some of the capabilities that we've delivered. Yes. All right, thank you, Jason. So let's take a little deeper dive into what is IBM Containers. And when I say IBM Containers, I want to lead with there's nothing proprietary to the actual engine or registry or runtime. So all of your existing Docker collateral, you can bring those and run them natively within the Bluemix cloud platform. So if you have Docker images, Docker files, et cetera, you can come and bring and run those here. Within IBM Container Service, it is a fully managed cloud service. So this, the user journey begins at instantiating your first live container or pushing your first image up to your private hosted registry. There is no concept of deploying virtual machines and managing them as a swarm cluster. As a part of the service, we handle the infrastructure, the OS, the patching, the security mandates, and let you focus on the actual innovation and the, the actual container aspect of it. Second thing, integrated monitoring and logging. Regardless of your image source, there's no agent that's required. You deploy your container, and out of the box, you have CPU, memory, and network I.O. You also have default Docker logs, and you could also specify any other log file for an application in that container that would output to a specific path and have those directly within the console or via the CLI. Load balancer. So this way we can take your incoming request, use a round robin logic to distribute those workloads to the number of containers within your group. The registry I touched on, each organization within the Bluemix platform has their own hosted private image registry. So as Jason touched on, Docker Hub is a great place with the layers and we can start, pull images and build from that. But we also think that our customers need their own hosted registry to store images that they do not want publicly accessible and also, it's close to the actual runtime. And then lastly, auto-scaling. So you can set policy based on CPU or memory utilization and scale up or down based on your workload, based on thresholds that you specify. Advanced security, Jason touched on this as well. We think that security is very important. In July of 2015, we announced a capability called Vulnerability Advisor. Regardless of image source, so it's something IBM provided, something you've pulled from Docker Hub, or something you've built yourself, we will introspect that image before you deploy your first live container and identify not only known vulnerabilities, so you've got packages that are outdated and now vulnerable, but also the policy side. So we've got SSHD enabled in that image. These are things that we don't want to do in a container world anymore. It's a new paradigm from VMs to containers, and so we're helping you identify those vulnerabilities and minimize that attack surface once you actually deploy your first container. We also have a policy management so the administrator can set policy to let their users either warn them and still allow them to de deploy containers from those images or to completely block them. And then lastly, built using Docker technology. So I talked about it being using uh, the same open source Docker that you could run on your laptop 
Therefore, you've got the same user experience, the same Docker CLI and APIs that you would have natively on your laptop. So let's dig a little deeper. First thing is delivery choice. So this is very important from an IBM perspective. We have three delivery models. Typically, when you think of cloud, you think multi-tenant, shared, public cloud resources. And of course, we have that as part of the offering today where you can go out, build, run, manage your containers. There's a second delivery model called dedicated, which this is essentially a single tenant cloud offering still running in an IBM data center, but it's single per your organization. And then the third delivery model is local. This is where you need the cloud platform running in your data center on your hardware, but again, still a fully managed cloud service provided by IBM. Persistent storage. Obviously, we do want to store um, data within the containers themselves. If a container crashes or we need to update a new version, any data within that container is lost. So we've got a few ways that we can manage the life cycle of that. One is leveraging existing Bluemix database services, and we could store data directly there. Or secondly, we've got volumes where you could store. They can be read-only, read-write. We manage the life cycle of the volume, so if the container is upgraded or crashes, the data and the volumes are still there. Content, also very important. So IBM has middleware that's running data centers across the world today. Each of our product teams are looking to containerize, either completely refactor their products to run in a microservices and container-based architecture, or to add new capabilities via Docker images. Cloud integration. Clearly not everything can or, or probably should run within a container. So what we've done is enabled you to consume cloud APIs directly within our container service. So whether you're using something from the Bluemix catalog like a Watson or analytics or IoT, when you deploy that container, we'll marry that and bind it to a service and you can leverage it directly within the container. Overlay networking. Each time you deploy a container, it gets deployed to a private network, non-routed, so that way all of your containers and your microservices architecture can communicate directly via IP. We don't need to worry about port mapping. They can talk directly. You can also easily request and bind a publicly routed IP address for the component that you are then ready to expose on the port that you've exposed when you deployed that container. Security, we've talked about the integration of Vulnerability Advisor and how easy we've made that transition and consumption of that security service. So that way, our developers are out there developing code. We integrate and make security very easy and very easy, easily consumed by them in their DevOps process, integrating it into their CI CD pipeline with the DevOps tooling. The scalable groups that I touched on briefly. So this enables you to deploy a group of n number of containers we can set auto recovery, so if something fails or crashes, we'll automatically redeploy that workload to keep you at the threshold that you set. We have a, with that load balancer, a fully qualified domain name. You can either use one that's provided by IBM or you can bring in your own domain name and use that. So let's take a little look at some of the architectural differences from, on the left-hand side, within IBM containers, we have a pure container native platform. And what this does, this enables us to have additional visibility and control from not only the logging and monitoring, but also most importantly from the security perspective. Not only to the known vulnerabilities, but also we're looking to add capabilities around introspection to the actual application, identify weaknesses in your architecture and topology, and help you identify and minimize that um, uh, risk. Whereas when you look at containers that are deployed in an IaaS, so you're, you're deploying and managing your own virtual machines, we don't have that ability to introspect down into the actual operating system and surface that information around the security to the end user. Take a quick uh, look at a few slides here. Uh, this one is the, our current UI that shows and you can do this again. Whether you want to use the native Docker CLI, if that's what you're comfortable with, you can do that. Or if you're a UI person like I am, I could go directly in here. I can either do a single deployment or I could do a scalable group. I can specify the name, 
the size. So this is predefined CPU, memory, and disk for that container. I could assign a public IP now or after the fact. And I could also do the advanced options where I set an environment variable, mount volumes, et cetera. So this takes a look at once I've actually instantiated some workload, I've got insight to this is a group with two instances. I see the memory consumed, the quota usage against what I've been allocated for my space, some information about the routes. I can dig into the individual containers in that group. This is just going to show, right now I run a Docker version. You can see it's on my laptop. Docker images, this is everything that's local. Next, I'm going to export my Docker variables. And essentially, what this is doing is now pointing against the Bluemix cloud platform. Now when I run a Docker version, you'll quickly notice that it's pointing to Bluemix containers. Now all my Docker commands are pointing against the Bluemix cloud. These show my images that are in my hosted private registry. PS shows my um, images that are running up there. And then what this will do, now I'll do a Docker run and deploy a live container that will actually be running in the cloud. I could also unset those variables if I wanted to run Docker commands directly on my laptop. Again, the same syntax that you're used to from your laptop pointing directly at Bluemix. Now we're deploying this example as a Mongo database container exposing the same ports, and you can see I'll do a Docker PS grep for that name, and you can see that this guy was just deployed. So we really touched on how IBM is providing tools at each of these steps within the container lifecycle management to help take that application that's so easy, as we saw in the keynote today, you can very quickly deploy Docker to your laptop and be up and playing with it. But the challenge comes, how do I take that and move that into a production life cycle and actually maintain it and roll out upgrades and, and actually run it in a production environment? IBM has, has always embraced this open architecture. You can see here, starting down, we've talked about the deployment models, choices that you have. Within the Bluemix brand, the Bluemix platform, you have your choice of whether you want a pure platform as a service with Cloud Foundry, Docker with a container as a service, virtual machines with infrastructure as a service, or announced in February of this year, OpenWhisk, which is our serverless, um, event-driven uh, compute choice. And then, of course, you can build on that with the services that you want, integrated logging, monitoring, microservices support. And then lastly, at the top layer, integrating with those domain services, like I'd mentioned, Watson and other capabilities that you can leverage directly via API. Quick look at what the monitoring and logging looks like. Again, all built on open standards. standards. So whether it's the Elk stack or Kibana, you can go directly into those tools natively and dig, create your own dashboards or reports. You could also use a sidecar to take all of that data from the service and export it to whatever uh, service of choice that you have running. When I go to deploy a container, I could see again from my UI, so this shows all of the images that I have in my own private hosted registry. I also have the security insight. On the lower left, you'll see the vulnerability assessment. This is done not only when I first deploy or push an image to my registry, but then it also does it periodically because obviously new vulnerabilities are identified and I want to have insight into them. So I can see which of my images are, are good and which have something that I need to investigate. This is a standard security report. So I can see here on this particular image, it found 29 vulnerable packages within this image. From a policy perspective, you can see here that I've got SSH enabled on this, and we would theoretically want to disable that and use something like a Docker exec or Docker attach to um, access that container. Quick look at the policy management. So as I set the situation over here, right now they're all to warn, and it scans my registry, they're all safe. If I change that policy to block and then save it, in real time, it'll scan all of the images in my registry and then potentially 
move images from the deploy tab to the caution or blocked tab. Very important to update without downtime. So we've got a service called Active Deploy. This is the, the UI that shows you this. Again, you can do the same thing via the command line. But essentially, you can set your old version, your new version. You can specify how much of a bake-in period you want, how quickly you want to. You could also automatically roll back in the event that something does not upgrade or perform as you had expected it to. So let's uh, take a quick look at some of the enhancements since we last talked at um, DockerCon Europe in Barcelona. Native Docker Compose support, directly the same CLI uh, that you use today, the same YAML configuration. Once you export and point directly at Bluemix, you can run Docker Compose up, scale, down. All the same Docker Compose capabilities that you're used to, you can do that against the Bluemix container service. And then it would just, you can see here that shows my individual containers as well as my groups that I have deployed. So some of uh, additional enhancements, again, uh, keeping up to date with the Docker engine. We have groups that are performing performance and scalability testing of all these open source projects. A lot of them, or many, uh, are not really multi-tenant or scale or perform once we hit a certain threshold. So IBM works very closely with the community. Once we find kind of the threshold where it, it starts to underperform and we work with the community to then fix that and, and do it through the community as opposed to our own proprietary code. Bring your own IP support. So this, you could extend your network with a VPN as a service and leverage the same networking ranges both on-prem and in the cloud. Performance improvements are always important, something that we're always striving to do using the open tools. Uh, you can see here some of the new things that we've done around volume. So we've got more granularity and size and IOPS control, letting you meet uh, your requirements for your use case. So with that, I want to make sure I save enough time for Jason and his demo. All right. So a lot of... Uh... A lot of content there. I mean, I hope um, what you guys saw from that is, is maybe a couple things. One is um, native Docker experience, right? Docker API, use the native Docker tools. Uh, we're part of the ecosystem. We're running Docker Engine. We're running um, the same core kind of swarm experience. But around that, we've done some things, integrating it with a broader cloud platform, enabling you to use services on the cloud, enabling you to get some of those more advanced features. like. Uh, maybe it wasn't as obvious, but those logging and monitoring views that we, we clicked through, um, you know, we've automatically instrumented the container service environment for that information. You don't have to do anything to your images. You don't have to add agents. You don't have to integrate with Elk. You don't have to do anything. You just run your container on the container service, and you will get visibility into that application. You will get all the log data going into a, uh, an Elasticsearch a log analytics system, you'll get all of the metrics about the container going into a monitoring system. Vulnerability advisor to do image scanning. Again, you don't do anything to your image. You push it to your private registry on Bluemix, it'll automatically tell you if there's anything in that image uh, from a package standpoint or a config standpoint that's vulnerable. Right? Active deploy, so automated orchestration tools to help you roll out new versions of applications into production in a non-disruptive way. It takes care of all the deploy operations, all the scaling, all the route management so that your application traffic can be routed across to the new instance. So the idea here is that you as a Docker developer can build applications, you can run them on your laptop, you don't do anything special to your images, you run them in a container service on the cloud, and around those come all of those lifecycle tools without any changes to the application. That's the idea. Now, I thought maybe a fun way to show that would be to show a little demo. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something probably inadvisable, which is to fly a helicopter in a room full of people. Um, if you're in the front row, I'm sorry. Like, this is a good gesture, if necessary. Um, this is what we're gonna do. Um, so I built an app um, that um, uses a container to interface between this drone and Watson. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Watson is our set of uh, cognitive 
computing, you know, machine learning and AI services uh, on cloud, exposed through Bluemix. Watson has uh, 20 plus APIs to help you do everything from speech processing to natural language recognition to image processing and image recognition. In this case, we're gonna have, we have an app um, running in a container on IBM container service um, that takes uh, photography from this drone, uh, uploads it to the cloud, sends it to Watson, uh, Watson analyzes the image and detects people that it sees in the picture. And then tells you, are you a boy or a girl, and how old it thinks you are. And I apologize in advance if it gets any of that information wrong. <laughs> I mean, it's not my fault. We'll yell at Watson. So let's, uh, let's give this a try and see if, um, if everything works. We're still reading. That's good. All right. We'll just trim it a little bit, you know, so it doesn't take off. All right, so um, now this is a dark room, so sometimes the photography is a little tough. Right, here we go. All right, while this thing is hovering, it can fly itself, don't worry. It's, it's fine. All right, so this is the last image I grabbed. So what I can do here is, well, uh, it's okay, it's okay, really. It's okay. Brianna works for me. It's like she gets hurt, I have to pay for it anyway. Ha! Huh. It's intentional, come on. What? All right, here we go. I got a cutout alert. Just in case you know, ta -da. So here's a simple example. So I took one picture, right? Oh, it refreshed on me twice. It liked the other picture better. Let's try this again. It could, it's possible. All right. People are less confident now than they used to be. Come over here. Okay. That was more controlled landing. All right, that was a dark picture. Let's see if Watson gets anything this time. It got it the first time. Sometimes these dark images is tough. Here, I'll show you the. Uh, the actual result when it gets a good image. Oh. This one. So what Watson does, so what this application does is take this image and send it to Watson. Watson's pretty cool, it goes through. Here's a much cleaner image. <laughs> um, automatically figures out all the people in the image. And you can see under each one, it's guessed like male or female confidence scores. One of the cool things about Watson is it not only gives you an answer, but it actually gives you either the rationale or the confidence that it has behind that answer. And so you can see it's pretty confident on everybody's uh, sex. Age is not so confident, right? 18, 24, 70%. Guy in the end, he thinks is a kid, 42% under 18. Um, so it's automatically done image processing to figure that out. So let's look really quick at how this uh, was built. First, so structurally it looks like this. It's a pretty simple application actually. Um, so uh, I have the drone. There's a piece of code on my laptop that's interfacing with the drone, uh, automatically uploading images every time I take a picture. Sends that up to a container group running on IBM Container. So there's a load balancer in front. Uh, there's a cluster of uh, Docker images running. Uh, this uh, Rebel Watson container group. Uh, that uh, container's doing two simple things. One, receiving that image, takes that image through a REST API, sends it on to Watson. Watson sends back um, a JSON description of what it thinks is in the image. How many people it thinks it's fine, the pixel positions of their face within the image, and then the sex and age with confidence scores, right? And then the, the, uh, the application stores that image in uh, 
a persistent store. One of the things that container service supports is persistent storage volumes in the cloud being attached to containers and in fact being shared. So in this case, I have a shared volume sh between these two containers. So I can go to either one, I can load balance to either one and it'll write that data to the shared container. And then um, the browser application that I was showing you is reading from that container, downloading the image and downloading the metadata about the image and drawing that overlay over the top. Pretty straightforward application. Um, using the power of AI and containers uh, to build something cool. Now, if I just look at this on Bluemix real quick, let's cancel out of here. So, so this is that interface that Chris showed you. Um, so I have this container group running two instances. I could easily uh, add more load. So um, you know, when this thing gets tweeted and goes viral and everyone's like trying to check out the drone images, I can crank up more capacity. Um, you can see I have two running right now. You can see basic information about uh, CPU and memory. Uh, you can see where it's uh, published on the internet. So it'll now go way through the roof in a minute. Um, and you can see the Docker image that I'm running. Uh, here's the volume that I've attached. So this is a, a shared block volume in the cloud called drone images that's mounted into the containers at slash images. Um, uh, so really easy interface. I could come in here and look at logs. I could look at metrics. A really simple interface for me to be able to deploy and manage this container in the cloud. So that's just something fun to uh, give you a sense for some of the cool things you can do. Um, it, it really reinforces for me one of the uh, really uh, important ideas about containers is that containers don't live by themselves. Containers uh, have to work with everything else that we have. Containers have to work with cloud services. They have to work with uh, other deployment architectures. And so running containers in a full-fledged cloud platform that has everything from you know, bare metal and VMs to Watson and IoT and analytics functions uh, is a really powerful capability to kind of combine uh, things together. Now, I want to end with, um, with one other topic, uh, which is microservices. So um, that application I just showed you uh, is not really a microservices application. It's a simple, single uh, container application. But the reality is what many of you are doing uh, is building applications that are comprised of multiple containers working together. Um, and sometimes those containers are, um, are kind of independent of each other. Sometimes those containers are very tightly linked. Maybe you're using uh, Docker Compose to stand up a bunch of containers uh, together. Uh, and they always come up together and go down together. Maybe you're using something like pods in Kubernetes to stand up a pod of related containers. Uh, but often what you have is a set of containers that have independent lifecycle that you're connecting together, right? And that's really the idea of microservices. So this is my, my definition of what a microservice is. Um, microservices is one of those terms that everyone has a price slightly different definition at this point in time. Uh, this is mine. It's an engineered approach, uh, an engineering approach focused on decomposing an application into single function modules uh, that have well-defined interfaces which are independently deployed and operated by a small team who owns the entire life cycle of that service. Containers are great for this, right? Um, microservices accelerate delivery by minimizing communication between and coordination between people while reducing the scope and risk of change. So microservices is about letting small teams work independently of each other so they can all go fast, right? Now for microservices to work, you need some help, right? Because microservices are making a trade-off between um, complexity and speed of delivery, right? Microservices are optimized for speed of delivery. And what I get out the back end is a more complex operational environment. I get, instead of you know, a monolith, I get 500 microservices, each clustered, all talking to each other over the network. That's a complex operational environment, but each of those things can move independently, right? So what ne what's needed is some help, all right? Now, if you look at containers and you look at the container space that we're all uh, here learning about, um, there's a lot going on around microservices. There's a lot of the kind of core runtime capabilities uh, for hosting microservices, the orchestration capabilities that we saw uh, a little bit in the demo as far as uh, deploying clustered environments and auto recovery and auto scaling and updating. You need all those things. Um, but there's also this whole problem of how do you actually discover each other and wire things together and how do you do that in a compelling way? And there's uh, lots of different perspectives on this in the industry. And one of the things that we've been working on is kind of our own perspective on a framework to help you build container-based microservice applications. And I'm excited to announce that this week at DockerCon, we uh, made available an open source project called Amalgamate, uh, which is our view of how to build uh, microservice applications in containers, all right? Um, so Amalgamate lets you compose and orchestrate multi-language microservices 
um, using containers, right? Uh, there's a couple of important ideas here. One is uh, polyglot, multi-language, right? You know, as we look at how people are building applications today, they need a microservice framework that doesn't make any assumptions about what language you're using to build that application. There's some microservice frameworks that are better in one language than another or very tied to a specific language. Uh, we felt we needed a microservice framework that worked in any language and that could be added on to your container without requiring changes to the container itself. Just like we talked about in the container service with this idea of adding operational lifecycle tools as uh, capabilities the environment provides around your container, we thought we needed the same thing uh, for microservices apps. You want to build your container and be able to connect it into a microservice fabric without having to modify the container itself. Um, so Amalgamate uh, does a few things. First, it has a platform, and it's platform and runtime independent. So this is a framework that, of course, runs on IBM containers. It runs on straight Docker. It runs on Kubernetes. It runs on Google Cloud Platform. It runs in any Docker environment. Uh, you could run this framework and use it to uh, build uh, microservice applications. Uh, Multi-tenancy is supported out of the box. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've pushed on a lot in our container services is this idea of multi-tenancy, that the service itself, the container environment itself, needs to support multi-tenancy from a user and deployment perspective. Um, that we don't want to stand up entire sets of infrastructure for every user. We want to have a shared infrastructure, deploy multiple applications into it, and let the infrastructure manage the tenancy between those components. Um, uh, the third really important idea now in Amalgamate is this idea of a programmable communications fabric, um, meaning you have a lot of programmable control about how traffic flows between services within your application. And you can do cool stuff. Not only normal stuff like uh, you know, graduated rollout and canary testing and a differential deployment of, of traffic, you know, 10% here and 90% there, but you can also do things like introduce arbitrary delay. I mean, I don't know how many of you have actually spent time building a complex microservice app you run into all kinds of nasty problems, like service A calls service B. Service B's timeout is 10 seconds, right? It'll wait 10 seconds before failing. But service A that's calling it only waits six seconds, right? And so all of a sudden your app doesn't work and you don't understand why because you're like, well, this, this should have waited 10 seconds and you don't realize somewhere down the chain somebody else made a different assumption. So with Amalgamate, you can actually, on the fly, program in arbitrary delays between services. You can test the behavior of that application as different network delay situations would occur and make sure that you get correct behavior. So a really rich and programmable communications fabric between the services. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, focus on shortening the development cycle. You know, how do we automatically do registration for service discovery and automatic load balancing uh, and automatic red black deployment and canary testing features. Just to give you one snapshot of, uh, of what it looks like. Uh, Amalgamate basically has two pieces to it. There's a control plane element, uh, which is essentially a, a controller and a registry that provides a set of API endpoints to go in and control and manipulate your application and, of course, for the microservices to discover each other. Um, and then within each tenant, right? I said this was multi-tenant. So the control plane is shared across multiple tenants in, your, in the cloud. Um, that in each tenant, in each application, you have a set of components that are running. The most important thing is these these black bars, um, which are basically sidecars. So within each uh, container host, next to your container is automatically injected a sidecar container, which handles all of the outbound traffic from service A to service B, right? So it provides us uh, a client-side control point for discovering the other services, for figuring out which version to route to, for introducing delay, for doing canary testing, for doing all those advanced functions, but it runs in a sidecar next to your container. So you don't have to modify A or B. You can inject A or B into this fabric and it can provide all those capabilities without you modifying your app. So if you ran that on your laptop without the fabric, you did a unit test with just that component, you don't have any dependency on the fabric, you can just run the container as is. So that's Amalgamate. I just want to introduce that to you guys. Um, you can go to amalgamate.io right now or join us on GitHub. Um, uh, you know, I think there's some interesting uh, and compelling uh, capabilities here to help you take uh, a container or Docker environment as a base and build on top of it uh, the advanced application structures we need with microservices and then run that in a cloud platform that provides all the lifecycle tools around that application that you need to be successful. So let me leave you uh, with uh, a, a challenge to go out and build something cool yourself. Um, this drone demo doesn't do anything useful, um, but it was incredibly fun to write. It took me a day to create, 
and run. And it's just amazing to me the things that are available to all of us now, especially in cloud environments. I mean, go back five years and, and say, hey, I want to do like a visual image processing, face recognition application connected to a drone, and come back and talk to me in a couple years when you deployed your neural network and all your machine learning software and you figured out how to make all that run. And today, you can go to cloud and you can access all that stuff through a simple REST API. Uh, you can use Docker containers to deploy things quickly, and, and in a matter of hours, you can build something amazing. Uh, so with that, um, I think we have five minutes. If there's any questions, comments, anything? Yeah, in the back. Uh, so what orchestration engine do you have that's backend? Oh, in our container service. Um, so our container service is using elements of, uh, today, is using elements of Docker and some elements of OpenStack. So one of the things that we, um, you know, our infrastructure platform in Bluemix is, uh, is using OpenStack. And one of the things we didn't talk a lot about is in our container service, uh, all the containers run in private overlay networks. So every tenant of the cloud gets a private level two network. All the containers run on that private network. Um, all your containers get a private IP address and optionally either a public IP address or a route, an HTTP route like I showed here. And that's all kind of coming out of the OpenStack layer underneath. So we're using a, a combination of Docker componentry and, and uh, OpenStack componentry. Um, as, as you may know, we're also uh, big participants in both OCI and CNCF. And so we're working with our colleagues at Docker and Google and Red Hat and others to kind of bring forward the evolution of Swarm like the stuff you saw today and also Kubernetes. Um, and kind of bring those into the platform as well. Any other questions? Nothing? You guys all want to come up and fly the drone? Is that, is that anything? Oh, um, uh, yes, I mean, I can talk to you about the details of that uh, offline, but yes, if you think about IoT scenarios in particular, there's a big role for pushing uh, computation closer to all the devices and out onto the edge of the network, and there's absolutely some work going on leveraging containers as part of that model for kind of getting some of that processing out closer to the devices, absolutely. Anything else? Any other questions? No? Well, we'll be up here. Thank you very much for coming, and uh, hope it was good. <laughs>